Greetings, everyone. Today I will tell you about quadratic reciprocity, another very interesting subtopic of the vast branch of number theory. Now, similar to the development of Euler's theorem from Fermat's Little Theorem, the ideas of quadratic reciprocity begin with Fermat and were carried on by Euler and Legendre. At the turn of the 19th century, however, came Gauss, and he truly changed the game. Now, just to start with our definitions, and uh, by the way, we'll start with these uh, documents from the Union University in Tennessee. Well, this is actually from a, the presentation of a senior paper. We say that a number is a quadratic residue, modulo p, if there exists, and I'm going to write this down for you, so this is just a, a definition in number theory. A is a quadratic residue, if and only if, there exists some integer x that solves this equation x squared equals a mod p. And we'll see many examples of this. But this is really what it means to be a quadratic residue. If there is some square which is congruent to a mod modulo some prime number, uh, otherwise it is a non-residue. And the Legendre symbol is a way of writing this concisely. It can be viewed actually as a binary function of some sort, as it returns either a, a 1 or a negative 1 based on this condition. Is A a quadratic residue mod P? In actually many cases you'll see this written as uh, P over Q in, in many equ uh, equations, but A over P is also, it means the same thing, it's the same notation uh, where we have in parentheses, one number over another. And in fact, Associate Professor Pete L. Clark has, uh, has a well-done document on quadratic reciprocity, and eventually we'll get to see a, a, a paper written by him about it. And even he points out that the history of these developments in number theory can be a bit elaborate, to say the least. Nonetheless, uh, it's all interesting, so let's begin. Now that we know about this very, very, you know, the, the basic definitions of the Lysander symbol. And so, we're going to start here. And it says, let our prime be equal to 13. And so that means we're focusing on the numbers really 1 through 12, the, the integers, to determine which of those numbers is a quadratic residue modulo 13. We can pretty much neglect 0. Usually you'll see that non-zero residues are the important thing, the, you know, more significant. And as you can see here, modulo 13, uh, we know that basically all the distinct integers, we're going to, yeah, we're going through all the distinct integers, 1 through 12, and squaring them and measuring what that is, modulo 13. So you can see this, this kind of pattern here where 1 squared is equal to 12 squared, modulo 13. 2 squared is congruent to 11 squared. 3 squared is congruent to 10 squared. 4 and 9, 5 and 8, 6 and 7. Their squares are equal, modulo 13. And there is actually a reason for this, and I can prove this for you as well. So, basically, what we've observed is that n squared is congruent to the quantity p minus n squared mod p. And we can manipulate this equation in order to discover why it's true. And if you don't know where I got this, just look back here and you can see that, you know, in this case our prime number is 13. And so when n is 1, well 1 squared is congruent to 12 squared, that's the pattern we're, we're finding. 2 squared is congruent to 11 squared, so clearly n whatever n is, p minus n has a square that is equal. And so if we expand this, we can get n squared is congruent to p squared minus 2pn plus n squared mod p. And at this point, we can actually subtract this quantity from the right side, and we can say n squared minus the quantity p squared minus 2pn plus n squared, is congruent to 0 mod p. 
And so n squared minus p squared plus 2pn minus n squared is congruent to 0 mod p. So, and when, any, when anything is congruent to 0 mod p, it is, it's just saying it's divisible by the prime number p. And so at this point, I'm sure you can tell that we can actually cross out the n squared, and we get this quantity 2pn minus p squared, which is true. So we're getting a true statement because, again, we can factor out this p and get uh, p outside of the quantity 2n minus p being divisible by the prime. And that's true, and all of this is biconditional. You know, all of the steps we've been doing are, it's just, just basically algebra. So we know that since this line is true, our hypothesis is true. So that's just a brief explanation of why that must be true. Hopefully that helps explain this pattern we're seeing, or at least a, a part of it. And basically, since we're finding these squares modulo 13, this final column turns out to be the quadratic residues, modulo 13. And so that's what this final line is saying. Actually, and this in before. Um, and so this is just another way of writing what we just stated. Uh, we know what the quadratic residues are, 1, 3, 4, 9, etc. So we can write it in this notation, and of course it's all modulo 13. So 1 over 13 is equal to 3 over 13, equal to 4 over 13, equal to 9 with respect to 13 etc. And that's all equal to 1 because they are the quadratic residues. And for the non-residues, well, that would be everything else modulo 13. Uh, all of those other positive integers up to 13. So 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 11. They're, they'd be given negative 1 by this notation. And so, regarding the history, you know, this, is, this is talking about Euler's criterion, which is what I'm about to say. Uh, in 1748, Euler actually proved something very special about quadratic residues. And what he actually proved was this statement right here. It's important to, to read these things carefully. Basically, if we know that p is an odd prime, so any prime other than 2, and a and p are coprime, meaning the greatest common factor between them is equal to 1, then A will be quadratic residue with respect to P, if and only if this equation is true. So if A to the quantity P minus 1 over 2 is congruent to A, uh, 1 modulo P. And so let's actually see this demonstrated, shall we? Let's see some examples of how this is true. Now, we just studied everything modulo 13, so let's go back to that slide, shall so we? So Euler's criterion, if we are truly studying it, then we will say... You know, what is A to the quantity P minus 1 over 2? And what is that quantity modulo P? So I wanted to do this for each of these trials, just to show you a demonstration. P is defined to be equal to 13. So P minus 1 all over 2, well, that is 6. So for each of these, we're actually going to be raising this number to the power 6, and then modding it by 13. It might seem like a somewhat random thing to do, or at least it certainly did to me, but we will um, see how it all works out. So that's the first step, and now we are computing what each of these numbers is modulo 13. Now, of course, the most basic one would be 1 mod 13. Well, that's simply just 1. But the others, well, it might be a bit more complicated. Okay, well, I've, I've checked them all, and it is indeed true. Uh, if you subtract 1 from each of these numbers, you'll get multiples of 13. You can check that for yourself, or just take my word for it. But this is simply a demonstration, just, you know, just one case where the prime number is equal to 13. And it abides by Euler's criterion, which is really very interesting. It's... It's a biconditional statement, that's really what makes it interesting, is that we know it's a quadratic re residue if and only if. So it goes both ways. If it meets this condition, it's a quadratic residue. If it's quadratic residue, it meets this condition. 
At least that's what I find so interesting about it. Because think about it, if we chose something that wasn't a quadratic residue, like 2 or 5 or 7, as you can see in this r row right here. In fact, let's try that. If we were to take this number, 100, this is, this is going to be 7 to the 6th power, just to check by Euler's criterion. So 7 to the 6th power is 117,649. And if we were to mod this by 13, we shouldn't get 1. Nope, we get 12. Again, just one example. But I'm demonstrating to you that no matter what we choose, we're not going to get any false positives or false negatives. This is a biconditional statement, so it's very strong. And in fact, the proof of this actually builds upon Fermat's little theorem. And one might say that's quite convenient, given that I just talked about that in the last episode. And the full proof can be found here in the description. But the gist of it is that... Let me go back to my paper. So Euler's criterion is talking about taking a to the p minus 1 over 2 and specifying that it's, zero, it's congruent to 1 modulo p. So you can tell that from proofwiki.org, we can choose a k such that k squared equals a, and then raise both sides of that equation to the quantity p minus 1 over 2. Now on one side of the equation, the squared and the over 2 cross out, so we end up with a to the p minus 1 over 2 equals k to the p minus 1. And k to the p minus 1, assuming that k and p are coprime, which they are, is congruent to 1 modulo p. And that's simply by Fermat's little theorem. And so in 1783, Euler conjectured this law of quadratic reciprocity. And between 1783 and 1796, Legendre, a contemporary of Euler and Gauss, attempted a proof of this, but unfortunately failed. And this is, of course, the same Legendre who came up with this, this notation. But in 1796, Gauss became the first to prove it. Uh, he was only about 20 years old, actually. And so he was, you know, as, as I've said before, he's my personal favorite mathematician. And he truly was very influential, especially in number theory. And he was the first to prove this. It was really quite amazing. And he, in fact, called it the Arum Theorema. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it's German for basically a golden theorem. And in his lifetime, Gauss actually published eight proofs of this theorem. It's really, it's truly amazing. To this day, at least 50 proofs have been discovered uh, for this law of quadratic reciprocity. So it's very interesting. If we're Going to that document to which I alluded earlier by Pete L. Clark, Dr. Pete L. Clark. So he describes the Legendre symbol as I described to you. And uh, you can read over what he has here, but basically he gives an example, let's say 97 on 101. And 101, of course, is a prime number. So is 97 for that matter. But he describes that we don't really have a very efficient way to determine whether 97 is a square modulo 101. Our only method is to compute all of the squares modulo 101. <laughs> and eventually, after some calculation, we find out that 97 is a square, a quadratic residue, modulo 101. So, and he gives some examples here. But basically what we're all, what we're building up to is the quadratic reciprocity law stated for you right here. So if p and q are distinct odd primes, then we know that p on q times q on p is equal to negative 1 to this special quantity, p minus 1 over 2 times q minus 1 over 2. And next we'll see some implications of what this means, but for now we can just admire the elegance of this and see that it's just awesome.